Hello all. I decided to do this series, Globalists in Parliament, because I wanted to highlight the British politicians who are supposed to work for you and I, but in fact are more concerned with a global agenda. Globalism largely is about um, heads of state and governments all around the world coming together and acting as one rather than taking care of their individual nation's interests. And I believe that that is wrong. It is absolutely my firm belief that we pay these politicians and we should be their priority, not some far-flung land. And that is why I decided to do this series. And to part three of this series, I'm going to focus on Mr. Michael Gove. Michael Gove has won a well-deserved place in Globalists in Parliament, and it is about time that he was fully highlighted to the people. He's a man who's been around media and Parliament for decades, never quite making it to the top seat, which he has desperately wanted, but was said to be so influential in the Conservative Party and the government that he was part of a coup to remove Boris Johnson, who was temporarily replaced by Liz Trust, and then Rishi Sunak was put in place because he was the man that they had long desired. Rishi Sunak is a man who brings together digital ID, central bank digital currency, and I have made a video about him and I urge you to watch that. So why have I chosen Michael Gove to be our third globalist in Parliament? Well, not least because he is one, but because he also appeared at the UK COVID inquiry last week. And so it would be remiss of me not to comment on a man whom I believe needs to be highlighted and toot sweet. First, some background. He was born Graham Andrew Logan in 1967. He's a British politician currently serving as Secretary of State for Leveling Up, Housing and Communities and Minister for Intergovernmental Relations since October 2022. He was born in Aberdeen. Gove was in care until he was adopted at four months old. He attended the independent Robert Gordon's College and studied English at Lady Margaret Hall in Oxford. His entrance into public life was as a journalist both locally and nationally. He spent a significant period as a leader writer at Rupert Murdoch's Times newspaper. Now, his roles in Parliament. He has held various cabinet positions under Prime Ministers David Cameron, Theresa May, Boris Johnson and serving Premier Rishi Sunak. Gove has twice run to become leader of the Conservative Party in 2016 and 2019, finishing in third place on both occasions. He was elected for the constituency of Surrey Heath in South West England in 2005 at the general election. He was appointed to the Shadow Cabinet by Cameron in 2007 as Shadow Secretary of State for Children, Schools and Families. He was then appointed Secretary of State for Education in the Cameron Clegg Coalition in 20, from 2010. And he was so unpopular amongst teachers that the National Association of Head Teachers, the Association of Teachers and Lecturers, and the National Union of Teachers passed motions of no confidence in his policies at their conference in 2013. In 2014, following a cabinet reshuffle, he was moved to the post of Chief Whip. Following the 2015 general election and um, Cameron's majority government, Gove was then promoted to Secretary of State for Justice and Lord Chancellor. So he's had some high offices. He was um, campaign manager for Boris Johnson in the 2016 Conservative Party leadership election. And this is where you start to get an insight into who he is. Because on the morning that Johnson was due to declare... Um, Gove withdrew and announced his own candidacy. And uh, so that gives you some idea. I hate backstabbers. It's like, don't jump on other people's tails. Do it on your own. And Gove, as you will see, is someone whom, in my opinion, cannot be trusted. Under Rishi Sunak, Gove was reinstated to his previous roles of Secretary of State for Leveling Up. And that is where he currently is. And uh, you may have been aware of him from more recently 
being a keynote speaker at Jordan Peterson's ARC conference. If you're not familiar with ARC, there are a number of exposés about it, including my video, which is available on here, and the work of Dr. Ursula Edgington, who has gone deep into the work of ARC and its backers, Legatum. Now, did you happen to hear Gove's speech? You'll need a sick bag handy if you didn't and if you're planning to. It started with a tribute to the ARC organisers. It was so insufferably sycophantic that if he was any further up their posterior he would be emerging out of their mouths one of them it, it was it was in my opinion one of the most gaslighting speeches I've heard in a long time he talks about accountability in business and government now bear in mind this is a man who has been at the heart of government for the best part of two decades that's like a fast food CEO saying there is a lot of obesity in this world and it must stop while profiting from it it's but you know the, the whole speech is just it, it's everything that I so detest and Gove actually frankly is everything I so detest for many reasons and as this unfolds you'll discover why but it's the final line during his arc speech that really gets to me he talks about how he's so proud to be alongside the arc founders and to launch this onto troubled seas now me personally i'd rather take my luck on a plank of wood and a broom on choppy waters then join the likes of Michael Gove, Jordan Peterson and Philippa Stroud. Um, what he did say though that was accurate is they are all reformers and they are but not for the good of people like you and I. ARC is run by people who hide their true purposes under the guise of Christianity but don't be fooled it's WEF light, World Economic Forum light. Um, it is modelled on WEF, it includes the uh, various WEF attendees and has similar posts to WEF such as you know sort of future young leaders etc etc and Gove of course is a WEFer because the chances are you are um, someone who is an attendee of the World Economic Forum in Davos if you make it onto Globalists in Parliament. Now, uh, Gove has recently had a bit of a drubbing in a book by a former colleague, Nadine Doris, another one I can barely stand. Honestly, I don't have a lot of time for politicians because they're just so in it for themselves. But Nadine Doris wrote a book that um, was quite interesting in which she talked about poisonous plotters in at number 10 whose job was to have extraordinary influence over government for the last couple of decades including removing Boris Johnson and eventually replacing him with Rishi Sunak and she claimed that this small gang of people have been manipulating the Tory party um, for the last 20 years. One of these that she claimed to be a master manipulator was Michael Gove. In fact, she actually says to quote her, during the course of my research, I quickly discovered that when it came to behind the scenes manipulation and manoeuvring, all roads lead back to Michael Gove. As one source told me, he binds all the dark arts people together. Now, she said that she observed him at cabinet meetings and he took notes, which was completely against the protocol. And she had often wondered why it had been allowed. And she said he always had two notebooks in front of him on the table, flicking the pages back and forth. Um, and she said he was a meddler who just couldn't help himself. She actually visualised him as Brutus for stabbing her crush, Boris Johnson, in the back in 2016, when he declared that he was going to be running for government as opposed to on the same ticket as Boris Johnson. And his betrayal ultimately resulted in Theresa May becoming Prime Minister, another hapless, hopeless individual leading us. But let us be clear, I don't for one moment believe that these people are particularly powerful. They're only powerful up to a certain point, and that is in terms of them being actors who are who are handled. I say this often, um, they will have handlers, we know that. But this story that Nadine Doris tells is really interesting because it, in, it includes what I consider the real nub 
of a handler. She calls this person Dr. No. She says this is somebody who has been paid by the cabinet office. She says that Rishi Sunak doesn't move without this person. She doesn't give him a name and that's presumed presumably because she recounts such horrendous things about this person including animal mutilation, uh, bribery, uh, imprisonment, all manner of horrendous things. And But some of the things that she has to say about Dr. No is really deeply concerning. And she says that he was and, oh, and has been for a very long time protected by Michael Gove. I'll quote her again. She said it was very clear there was no way Gove was letting him go. It was utterly bizarre. Dr. No is the strategist who the prime minister will speak to often, daily sometimes. For a man with a secretive past, he appears to have trouble keeping clear of the authorities. Dr. No loves violence too. If ever there was a demonstration in Downing Street and he's in there, he will slip out of the back door into the street and he seeks out the violent clashes. Now that is interesting because we've seen, for example, that Michael Gove has on two occasions found himself quite bizarrely amongst protests that included the anti-lockdown protests and the recent pro-Palestine protests. And she said, it really is quite remarkable. Over 40 years, only a handful of people who have been in number 10 could point him out to you. If a staffer ever asked, who is that man as he shuffled past, there would be no answer forthcoming. This is somebody who appears to have had a massive hold over the Conservative Party and Michael Gove for a very long period of time. And I'm going to quote her again because I think this is really interesting. Bear in mind, this is a woman who was at the heart of government and her book is claiming this about a sidekick of Michael Gove. She, sa she said, a veteran of the party told me, Dr. No was a bad-tempered, frightening man who has always operated in the shadows. He gives the impression that he has something over everyone, secrets over people in powerful positions related to his presence at the sex parties, maybe. Now, the sex parties were run by um, Dougie Smith. Dougie Smith is also part of this so-called shadowy group that Nadine Doris talks about. And it was like swingers parties. And Dougie Smith is another one that we are going to look at in the future. He's never been a politician, but he appears to have inordinate power over government. So Dr. No apparently was also involved in dirty dossiers. Um, she said it's one of his favourite modes of operation, according to her source. He used to do it on ministers. She said he, he there was one compiled about Liz Truss to get her out of office, which they managed because she was in office for like five and a half minutes. And the one composed about Liz Truss was said to be mostly sexual, disgusting and untrue, seriously made up nasty stuff. Now, we know for a long time that blackmail has been used in government and often to do with young boys. We know that. It's been admitted. And uh, so this is a, a, a deep, dark ally, allegedly, of Michael Gove, who is, our, as I say, our third globalist in parliament. Michael Gove has been involved in a number of controversies for a very long time. He's sort of been infamous for making really crude sexual comments. He's joked about paedophilia um, within top levels of government and used racist slurs when he was younger. Um, and uh, this is this is not new. People know about this. He joked at one stage about Leon Britton being a paedophile. Now, for researchers like myself, that's no joke at all. Leon Britton died without charge or conviction, although he has been extensively accused of paedophilia for many decades, including allegations that he was a regular attendee at uh, parties at the Elm Guest House in southwest London, where young boys were dressed up as fairies. They were brought in on um, coaches from care homes around the UK, and Leon Britton was said to be a regular attendee. So for Michael Gove to have made jokes about Leon Britton being a paedophile is as distasteful as it gets, frankly. Um, he's also has a history of absolute snobbery and elitism. When he was in his final year at Cambridge University, he made a comment about Margaret Thatcher, and I'm going to quote him. 
He said, at last, Mrs. Thatcher is saying, I don't give a fig for what half of the population say because the richer half will keep me in power. This may be immoral, but it's politics and it's pragmatism. And so that should give you a, a, a measure of who these people are. And that is they doff their cap to the rich and the rest of us can just swing, frankly, right? And uh, as I say, he's absolutely infamous for inappropriate jokes throughout the years. He's often dismissed it as, oh, I'm so sorry, it was my clumsy attempt at humour. Yeah, but that's the way you think though, mate, right? That's the way you think. It's uh, like, you can apologise as much as you want because that's political, but it gives us an insight into what is going on in your mind if you think it's funny to make jokes about someone who has been extensively accused of being a paedophile. It's weird. And I'll actually tell you, I, I, the, the joke he made about Leon Britton was he imagined Leon Britton uh, talking to him and saying that there was no sound sweeter than a young boy's voice breaking apart from the sound of the same boy in, involved in a certain act with Leon Britton. That is just weird. Who are you that you think that's funny? It's not funny. You're a weirdo. And um, so, so he's done a load of stuff like that. He's also shown a deep insight about his desire to privatise the National Health Service. He was one of several Conservative MPs who co-authored um, a direct democracy, an agenda for a new model party in 2005. And the book says that the NHS fails to meet public expectations and calls for it to be dismantled and replaced with personal health accounts. They want, this is something that they've been striving for for a very long time and they're getting ever closer to it. If you haven't realised, they're getting like increasingly closer to it. And, um, you know, and the thing is, he's in some respects, he's been backed up by his now ex-wife, Sarah Vine, who is a Daily Mail columnist. And she complained in a, a Daily Mail column um, in I think it was it was in 2015 that Gove could not have his foot x-rayed by the NHS because the minor injuries unit the couple visited did not provide the facilities at weekend. And this was found to be not true. Right. So you can see how media and politics work together. That's just one insight. And she has backed him up a number of times on his various agendas. As I've said before, you can tell a globalist by the type of by their voting record. OK, um, Let's just have a look at his. He's voted against the publicly owned railway system. He's voted for restricting the scope of legal aid. Yeah, the plebs don't deserve justice. He has voted for mass surveillance of people's communications and activities. These people are absolute control freaks. They want to know everything we're saying and doing. Um, he has generally voted for requiring the mass retention of information about communications. Again, surveillance society. Um, he has consistently voted for merging police and fire services, as like we haven't got enough problems. Generally voted against higher taxes on banks. I'm shocked. Generally voted against a banker's bonus tax. I'm shocked again. Almost always voted against increasing the tax rate applied to income over £150,000. Look, they take care of their own, don't they? He's generally voted for increasing the rate of VAT. Generally voted for higher taxes on plane tickets. Um, consistently voted for more restrictive regulation of trade union activity. Now, let me just be clear here. The trade unions were an absolute failure during C-19, but nonetheless, they do represent their members. To vote for more restrictive regulation of them is anti-people. It really is. Even though, as I say, trade unions were anti-people during C-19, generally they do represent their members. Um, and uh, sadly, a lot of their members fell for the C-19 nonsense anyway. He has generally voted for allowing national security um, evidence to be put before courts, um, which is problematic because, again, that lacks transparency. He has generally voted against a more proportional system for electing MPs because, it, you know, they want to keep the status quo as it is. He has consistently voted against slowing the rise in rail fares. I mean, we can keep going on this, right? 
you know, usual, usual stuff, the demonization of welfare recipients generally voted against raising welfare benefits, at least in line with prices, almost always voted against paying higher benefits over longer periods for those who are unable to work due to illness or, or disability, generally voted for reducing housing benefit for social tenants. Now, I, I have had I, in the past, I've, I have needed housing benefit to top up my income, especially when I was a single parent with a young child. And I can tell you from my own experience, and I know it hasn't changed because I still talk to people about it, already housing benefit never meets the actual rent, okay? It's an, it's an awful, ghastly system. And he has almost always voted for a reduction in spending on welfare benefits. And it goes on and on and on and everything you'd expect, really. He's generally voted for reforming the NHS. So GPs buy services on behalf of their patients. And this is the point when I come to when it becomes absolutely evident that not to have included him in my globalists in Parliament would have been rim would have been remiss on my part because the absolute hallmark of a globalist, especially in Parliament, is their Zionist boasts of allegiance. Gove has described himself as a proud Zionist. In 2019, he reiterated this, saying, "One thing I've always been since I was a boy is a Zionist." Really. That's interesting because when I was a girl, it didn't really cross my mind to even look into these issues. So that's interesting. So he was sort of ahead of the game in terms of his Zionism. And he is like the majority of UK conservatives. In fact, like um, many politicians across all parties, a member of Friends of Israel. Now, I cannot repeat this enough. If you're in Parliament, you should be representing us and you shouldn't be any part of a group like Friends of Israel. No, absolutely not. Right. Your duty is here with this nation, not overseas. OK. And he he goes all out for Israel and for, for Zionism. I have to tell you. OK. He has um, pursued bills, including one to ban public bodies from boycotting Israel. His bias towards the Jewish community is clear. During COVID, he gave a speech about Jews on the front line of the NHS. Really? It was was What about everybody else? Besides, I would have been much more impressed with his speech if he talked, if he was, if he actually fessed up to the fact that half these people weren't needed to be on any front line because, for example, they formed those Nightingale hospitals at much cost. They were never staffed because they didn't need to be. And, uh, you know, so he has shown his allegiance through and through. Again, I want to be very clear here. I believe that every British citizen should be protected by politicians. There should not be allegiance to one group or another. And the problem with Michael Gove is that he, he is actively showing his allegiance in a way that is problematic. I'll give you an example. Um, by contrast, Gove is considered a tad problematic when it comes to Muslims. Some people watch some people watch this will believe that all Muslims are terrorists because the media told you so. So let me be clear. I am an atheist up to the point of I don't believe in any form of organized religion. I see them as cults, whichever it is. I believe in a higher source, but that's a whole thing altogether. I am spiritual rather than religious. That said, I take people as I find them and demonising a whole religion based on the actions of the few is wrong. It is completely wrong. Um, and I am somebody who would protect any innocent person regardless of their religious or cultural affiliations. That's who I am and that is what I stand for. And, you know, even Tory Muslims are worried about Michael Gove's um, bias. He wants to introduce new hate legislation regarding anti-Semitism, but has skirted away from such things regarding Islamophobia, hasn't even been prepared to come up with a definition of what Islamophobia is. And he he has got his, um, he's ordered officials to draw up a new official definition of extremism. And it, it was said to be in a move designed to counter hate following the recent protests, the recent pro-Palestine protests, and with the focus on anti-Semitism. 
Again, we have to be incredibly careful about these hate laws that they keep wanting to extend. I understand that in line with the Equality Act, there there is levels of hate which can be insightful to people. And we must be very careful about that. But these politicians, these globalists and their globalist handlers, they want to silence us. They want to censor us. They want to stop us saying, oi, you, we know what you're doing. We're not allowing it. He's also a Bible basher. In 2012, he was behind plans to provide schools throughout England and Wales with a copy of the King James Bible inscribed with, presented by the Secretary of State for Education, the ego, you're a narc. Now, me personally, I think we need less religion in school, not more. He's also, again, in a nod to his snobbery roots, at the height of austerity, when food banks were exploding all over our nation. In 2012, he proposed for a new royal yacht costing £60 million, right? And uh, that just tells you who he is, right? It completely tells you who he is. So this brings me to him at the COVID inquiry last week. The UK COVID inquiry, he was there for several hours on Tuesday, November the 28th, 2023. And one of the most notable things was a series of WhatsApps that had been um, shown to the COVID inquiry in which during the height of lockdown, in September 2020, he was discussing plans to exempt fox hunting from COVID restrictions. It's very interesting. You can see it here. And so he's part of the hunting, shooting and fishing set, you know, the kind of lunatics who love spreading animal blood on their face because they're just weird. Um, not the animals, of course, the weirdos who are spreading the blood on their face and the rules are most significantly known for this. What he's told to do is that this should be presented in a way that it doesn't appear, appear on the face of the regs. We need to be very careful on how it is presented. So these people were behind the scenes trying to sort out their psycho fox hunting friends, despite regulations that impacted the rest of us. Now, we all know that the reason anybody in their right mind and with any kind of their critical faculties in place knows for a fact that the reason Partygate happened and, you know, their various breaches of the COVID regulations is because they knew they were unnecessary. Those regulations were not necessary. They were not worried about anything. They just scared the pants out of the rest of us. Well, not all of us. Some of us saw through them right from the get-go, but not everybody did. And that's why they were able to immobilize the world into lockdown through absolute fear. And Hugo Keith, who, who is the, the KC, the barrister at the COVID inquiry, clearly was irritated by Michael Gove. At one stage, he tells him, I'm asking questions because Michael Gove is trying to become incredibly political. And the British people were absolutely fleeced during C-19 with ministers facilitating huge contracts to their mates. One example, of course, is Michelle Moan and corruption investigators who were going through awards of multi-million pound contracts during COVID interviewed both Matt Hancock and Michael Gove as witnesses. And, you know, they were said to have been involved in recommending that Moan's unknown, unregistered company should receive oodles of taxpayer money for PPE. And one has to ask why. Michelle Moan's um, company, PPE Medro, was awarded two contracts via the government's VIP lane. Um, and this was after she had approached Michael Gove in May 2020 with an offer to supply PPE. She emailed fellow Tory peer telling him that Gove had asked her urgently to contact him and PPE Medro was awarded its first contract for 80.85 million to supply 210 million face masks and DHSC was awarded the second contract two weeks later for 122 million to supply 25 million surgical gowns. And we now know that much of this was unusable. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is Michael Gove. This is a man who is referred to as being part of dark arts in Parliament, who is a reformer attempting to create a society that benefits people like him, 
not people like us. And that is why he deserves to be highlighted. This is a weasel of the highest order. Watch out for him. I have a Patreon and details are in the description below. And I want to thank my patrons for making this video possible. And I want to thank my first Patreon producer, Paul Jackson. Thank you, Paul, for your support. And thank you all my patrons at Patreon. Uh, please join us if you're able. And if not, please continue watching, sharing, subscribing. All of it helps. Thank you so much. Let's get the word out about these people. Take good care of yourself.